All right, so our next lesson is about limits and their properties. So those of y'all who took AB last year are very familiar with all of this. Um, if you haven't seen these before, um, even those of y'all who took pre-cal, I think y'all did a pretty extensive limits unit, so you've probably seen these in some form or fashion. So I'm not going to read through all these. We'll refer back to this as we need them. All right, so first couple examples here. Um, we are given that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to 2 and the limit as x approaches a of g of x is equal to 3, and we need to find these limits if they exist. All right, so this is the limit of a product, limit of 5 times g of x. So I think we have a rule for that up here. Um, product rule, not that, constant multiple rule. This is the one we're looking at right here, number 5. Um, that if we have a constant inside there, we can, we can pull that constant out. Uh, where the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to L, so it's k times that limit. Okay, so we can rewrite this like this, 5 times the limit as x approaches a of f of x. Oh, sorry, g of x. All right, and then they told us what that limit's equal to. That limit's equal to 3, so this is 5 times 3, which is 15. All right, next one, we have the limit as x approaches a of 6 plus f of x divided by g of x. Okay, so we're going to use a combination of rules here. So we're going to use the quotient rule, that if you have the limit of a quotient, you can do the limit of each one separately. Okay, remember L is the limit as x approaches c of f of x, so that's that limit on top, and then the limit as x approaches c of g of x is m, that's on bottom. Okay, we're also going to use the sum rule because we have a, a sum here, 6 plus f of x. And so if you have a sum, you can just separate the two limits. All right. I don't love the way that they wrote this up here. I find this confusing. So I'm just going to rewrite this first one. And this applies for any time you see an L or an M down here. Okay, so when they see that, what they mean is that this is the same thing as the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So they're just separating them out, all right, into two limits instead of one limit. Okay, so that's what we're going to do on letter B here. We're actually going to make three limits. We're going to do the limit as x approaches c of 6 plus the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and then divided by the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So we're just applying multiple properties here. Okay, um, then just follow your order of operations. We're going to do what's on top first. The limit of a constant is equal to that constant. I don't know if that's up here or not. It's not, but that's the rule. If you have a limit of a constant, that's equal to the constant. The limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to, sorry, I keep scrolling, 2 right there. And the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to 3. 6 plus 2 is 8 thirds. All right, these are two properties that you need to know about. The limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta over theta is equal to one. And the limit as theta approaches zero of one minus cosine theta over theta is equal to zero. Okay, so if you were to plug in zero, sine of zero is zero over zero. So this would be a zero over zero in determinant form. So this is when you just memorize that you know that that one's equal to one. And if you plug in zero here, cosine of zero is one. So it's one minus one, which is zero over zero. So another indeterminate form. And again, you're going to memorize that that's equal to zero. All right, there's a, a real fancy proof of this one that uses the squeeze theorem, um, which we covered in calculus A, B, and might be on this lesson somewhere. I hope it is. Um, and Khan Academy did that one. I'll leave a link for this uh, proof in the Google Classroom, so you can watch that on your own if you like. Uh, but just to show you visually that that is true, I've graphed this function right here. Um, and you can see that as the x value approaches 0 from the left and the right, we are approaching a value function value of 1 right there. Um, and then same for the 
cosine function. Let me hide that one and show you this one. So here's that uh, one minus cosine x over x function. And as the x value approaches zero from the left and the right, the function is approaching zero as well there at the origin. So you can visually see it if you graph the functions. Um, and if you want a more rigorous algebraic proof, um, I'll leave that link for you in the Google Classroom. All right, so what you need to be able to do is memorize those and then apply them to a problem. So here's a couple problems. So this one deals with the sine theta over theta. Uh, notice they use the letter X. It doesn't matter what the variable is. Um, what matters is that the whatever's inside the sine function, theta, has to match whatever's on the denominator. So we have a 5X inside. We can't change that. That has to stay 5X. We can change the one on the bottom. So they're not the same. That's a problem. We need to make them the same. So the way we make them the same is we multiply by the number we want. So we can multiply, we want a five down there, not a four. And we're not allowed to just multiply the bottom, so we're gonna be multiplying the top and the bottom by the same thing. All right, now this five on top, we don't really need that. So I'm gonna put the five in front, all right? And it's gonna still be a fraction, so I'm just, but I'll tell you what's on the denominator in a minute. Then we're gonna have our limit as X approaches zero. And then we're going to have sine of 5x on top. And then what we want on bottom is a 5x. So I have the 5 right here that I multiply by, and I have the x that was already down there. Just like that. All right, so the other thing that I still have on bottom is the 4. So I told you this is still going to be a fraction. We're just going to pull that 4 out. Remember that multiplication is commutative, which means everything here is multiply. 4 times x times 5. I can rearrange those whatever order I want. So I want the four to be out here and I want the five to be here, okay? Um, also, one thing to make sure, make sure that your limit is approaching zero. This property only applies if the theta is approaching zero. So if it was X approaches one or X approaches infinity, then uh, that would be a totally different problem and you would not use this uh, property. All right, but it is approaching zero. This is the property that we're using. So um, now we know that this limit is equal to one. So this is 5 fourths times 1, which is equal to 5 fourths. All right, down here, uh, same idea. Um, we are going to, but we're going to split this up. So remember when you split up a sum, you do the limit as x approaches 0 of 2x and then common denominator. So the x goes under the 2x. And then our second limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. So x goes under both of them. This one uh, just simplifies to 2. The x's cancel. Limit of a constant is a constant. And this limit applies the property that we memorize that's equal to 1. 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. All right, good. Squeeze theorem. I was hoping this was going to show up, and here it is. So uh, that proof that I was just telling you about uses this theorem that we're about to go over to prove the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta over theta is equal to one. Um, and so here's how the squeeze theorem works. So basically, you're going to have three functions you're looking at. You're going to have an h of x, which is uh, less than your f of x, which is less than your g of x. Okay, you're going to be able to solve the limits for h of x and g of x, and they're going to have to be the same number. And since they're the same, and f is in between those two, f would have to equal that same thing. So f is going to be like your unknown. It's going to be a function that is impossible to solve. Either they didn't tell you what f was, and it's just some ambiguous function that they're asking about, or they told you, but it's one like sine theta over theta that you can't do any algebra on. Uh, it's zero over zero, and there's no other way to uh, manipulate it or simplify it to find the answer. Squeeze theorem is your, is your answer. All right, so pretty simple when put into, um, into practice here. So uh, we have two, that's our h of x. h of x can be a constant. Um, then we have our f of x, that's our unknown. That's what they're asking about over here. What is the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is our question. And then we have x squared plus two, which is our g of x. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to rewrite this inequality with limits. We are concerned with the limit as x approaches zero. So that's what we're going to put on all of these. You're going to do that on all three functions. Limit as x approaches zero of two is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches zero of f of x. That's what we're trying to find right there. 
which is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches zero of x squared plus two. And so the trick is you should be able to solve the limit on the left and the limit on the right, which is going to allow you to make a conclusion about the limit in the middle. Okay, so this is the limit of a constant, which is equal to a constant, so that's two. This is the one that we don't know, so we're gonna leave that how it is. And then this limit, you're just gonna do direct substitution, plug in zero, zero plus two is two. And so this limit's in the middle and it's greater than or equal to two, it's also less than or equal to two, so there's only one possibility. All right, so that's it. Therefore, the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is equal to two. And then I'm gonna put by the squeeze theorem. All right, this has shown up on an AP exam recently within the last couple of years um, on the free response. So they usually want you to write some sort of little sentence like this. You do not have to invoke the name of the theorem. Um, you could just say, therefore, the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is equal to two and put a period right there and you're good. Uh, but we have other theorems that we're going to have to do, and I always like to invoke the name. So I'm going to add that on there um, for you. All right, last thing we need to talk about are limits at infinity. Okay, there are a lot of techniques to solve limits at infinity, um, but I don't like doing all of those techniques because they're not really necessary. Okay, I'm going to show you the these should be quick. They're visual. You look at it, you know the answer. Okay, there are a few that are a little bit tricky that uh, we can talk about, uh, but most of the time you look at it, you write down the answer. Limits at infinity are the same thing as horizontal asymptotes. So they're gonna follow the horizontal asymptote rules. They're gonna be top heavy, they're gonna be bottom heavy, or they're gonna be balanced. Okay, if it's top heavy, you either get infinity or negative infinity. If it's bottom heavy, you get zero. If it's balanced, you get A over B. You have to divide the coefficients. All right, that's it. So those are your options. All of these are gonna fall into one of those categories. There are a few weird ones when you add in some exponentials that might be a little strange that we'll look at, but for the most part, that's how it's gonna be. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Um, we have first power, first power. So this is balanced, so divide the coefficients. So that's equal to four over eight, which is equal to a half. Like I said, these are visual and quick, okay? Uh, you're looking for X approaching infinity or X approaching negative infinity. It doesn't really matter which one unless you're dealing with exponentials, which again, we'll look at in a minute. Okay, uh, so this one's bottom heavy. Squared on bottom, first power on top, bottom heavy is automatically zero. This one's top heavy. Top heavy, you have to do a little bit of work. Okay, um, you have to figure out, is it positive infinity or is it negative infinity? So this one's approaching positive infinity. So you're gonna get a positive infinity on top um, divided by a positive on bottom. Um, so that's gonna be a positive infinity. Another option is you could do like a little simplify. Um, whenever you're doing, whenever you're making the X value get really big or really negative, any term that's smaller than the biggest exponent term is gonna go away. So like this plus one does not matter. We can ignore it. So if you ignored that, then you could just divide this, right? You get like two X over five. And if you graph two X over five, that's a linear function, it goes like that, positive slope. And so as X goes to the right, the function goes to positive infinity, it goes up. Had we been going to negative infinity, we would have gone left, we would have gone down. So that's kind of a visual way to think about uh, those top heavy ones. All right, these uh, get a little bit trickier, but not too bad. So you just have to square root or think about, what is that? Remember, you can ignore the one. You can ignore the negative in front. Okay, so a square root is a one half power. So that's x to the one half, and this is x to the first power down here. Bottom heavy. The exponent on the bottom is bigger than the exponent on the top. Bottom heavy is equal to zero. Okay, here, you can ignore those terms that are smaller than the biggest exponent term. All right, square root of x squared is x, and then 2x on bottom. All right, this one's balanced, first power, first power. So we divide the coefficient, so it's 1 half. You have to be a little bit careful about which direction you're going. 
So I'm going to go ahead and do this one over here, and then we'll talk about this. So this is the same problem, right? Exactly the same function. The only difference is we're going to negative infinity. Here we're going to positive infinity. So you, uh, you can ignore those. Square root of x is x over 2x. Balance, divide the coefficients, 1 half. All right, now one of these is not the right answer. Okay, so what you have to remember is that when you square root an x squared, you actually get the absolute value of x. Like that. And then the way that x is approaching, if it's approaching positive infinity, you're going to replace that absolute value of x with a positive x. So you get positive x over 2x, which is 1 half. So this is the correct answer for that, 1 half. But if your x is approaching negative infinity, you have to replace your absolute value of x with a negative x. So this is actually negative 1 over 2, so it's negative 1 half. All right, just a little more explanation on that. Um, the absolute value of x has a piecewise definition. Absolute value of x is equal to x when x is greater than 0. And the absolute value of x is equal to negative x when x is less than 0. And you can put an equal to on one of those. Um, I'll put it up here. Not both, though. One or the other. Doesn't matter which one. Okay, so if x is going to positive infinity, x is greater than 0. So that's why I replaced it with the positive x. If x is approaching negative infinity, x is going to be less than 0. So that's why I, I replaced it with negative x there. So that's a little tricky one on the square roots, right? So just be aware of that case. Uh, that'll show up every now and then. All right, these um, aren't traditional rational functions, but you can still think of them the same way. You still want to think about them as top-heavy, bottom-heavy, or balanced. Okay, so this one. Think about it as which one is more powerful. Is an e to the x more powerful, or is an x more powerful? All right, well, hopefully you know from your previous classes that an exponential function is much more powerful than just an x by itself. So that means that this is bottom-heavy, so this is equal to zero. Okay, now I want to talk about this a little bit more. What if we had the limit as x approaches infinity of x to the 999 nine, nine power over e to the x? Which one would be more powerful? Okay, so you see that 999 power, which is a humongous exponent, um, and that's going to make you think that's the more powerful one. It isn't. An exponential function is always more powerful than a power function, than a polynomial function. Always. Doesn't matter if this exponent is a billion. The exponential function, when x gets really, really big, will eventually overtake the power function. So that would be bottom heavy. That would be equal to zero as well. Okay, so exponential function, until we get to... Until we get to our very last lessons of the year, the exponential function is going to be the most powerful thing you encounter. Okay, so just be aware of that. All right, now this one has uh, two exponential functions. So this is balanced, right? Uh, we're going to positive infinity, so this is balanced, and so you divide the coefficient, so this is equal to 1. All right, now, there isn't one like this on here, so I'm going to have you add another problem. This problem is a little more difficult. x approaches negative infinity of e to the x plus 4 over e to the x minus 4. Okay, so here you want to think about what happens if I actually plug in negative infinity. So I actually get a negative exponent, right? So... Um, the AP exam does not like you to actually plug in negative infinity, so you have to kind of think about this. But if I plug in a negative, so let's say I plug in negative 100 just to get a big negative number. All right, so that would be uh, 1 over e to the 100, right? Because you can change that negative exponent to a positive by making it a fraction. And then what if I kept making that denominator bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? All right. Eventually, this uh, denominator would go to infinity. 
And if a fraction's denominator is going to infinity, that fraction is going to zero. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually it goes to zero. So if x was going to negative infinity, that would actually cancel out the e to the x's because it would make that function smaller and smaller and smaller. Let's uh, think about this visually real quick. The e to the x function looks like this. It has a point at 0, 1. To the right, it gets really big, really fast. To the left, though, it has an asymptote at 0. It gets really, really small, and eventually it approaches 0. So if I'm going to negative infinity, those e to the x's eventually go to 0. And if those go to 0, what's left? Positive 4 divided by negative 4. That would be equal to negative 1. So if you go to positive infinity, the 4s don't matter, and you have a balanced function. But if you go to negative infinity, those e to the x's end up canceling out. And then the 4s do matter, and that's what you're left with. So be real careful with exponentials and negative infinity versus positive infinity. With the negative infinity, the exponential functions would cancel out completely. Okay, so just be careful about that. All right, last one has a trig function. Um, so which one's more powerful, top heavy, bottom heavy, or balanced? Well, the x is going to continue increasing, right? It's a line, and it's going to keep going up. The sine function doesn't increase, right? It's oscillating up and down, up and down, up and down. So the way I kind of think of this is the sine function is staying the same the whole time, whereas the bottom is getting bigger. So if the top stays the same and the bottom gets bigger, then the fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's just like this exponential function. It's 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5, 1 over a million, 1 over a billion, 1 over infinity. All right, so eventually that fraction is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's going to go to zero. This is bottom heavy. So trig functions are basically like having a constant on top. All right, that's it.